Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? The program will begin in 10 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please. The program will begin in five minutes. Please move to your seats and help us start on time. As a reminder, please set your electronic devices to silent, but keep them at the ready so that you can text or email your questions for our guest to the address on the screen, askmetna at gmail.com.
Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of FCA International and the FCA Augusta Ford Gordon Chapter, welcome to day three of TechNet Augusta. As a reminder, please keep set your electronic devices to silent, but keep them at the ready so you can text or email your questions for this morning's panel speaker to askmetna at gmail.com. Prior to the conference, FCA asked our network of industry partners to submit solutions to eight problem statements provided by the Army Simers Center of Excellence. We received more than 50 responses and selected 13 to be presented this week in the Engagement Theater in the Exhibit Hall. We have published all of the submissions in a compendium you can find by selecting Solution Abstracts under the Program tab on the TechNet Augusta website. We would also like to recognize all of our sponsors for helping make TechNet Augusta possible. Please join me in thanking all of our patrons and sponsors. At this time, please join me in welcoming to the stage Brigadier General Paul Fredenberg, U.S. Army Retired, Executive Vice President for National Security and Defense, FCA International. All right. All right. All right. Welcome to day three. How's everybody hanging in there? Good conference? Yeah, this is awesome. I love it. I love it. Hey, FC is proud to prevent these professional forums, uh, the educational experience, uh, the team building opportunity for all of our government, industry, and academic partners. So thank you for showing up uh, and supporting our Army and, uh, and their future endeavors. Well, we had another action-packed day yesterday. Lieutenant General Skinner started us off in his usual fashion. Uh, he gave us a great update on where Joint Force Headquarters Doden and DISA are headed. Uh, and he highlighted several areas where they are directly partnering with, uh, with our Army to roll out IL-6 uh, JWCC capabilities. They're beginning to track CSSP readiness as they continue to uh, enhance the readiness of our cyber capabilities and defensive capabilities across the force and move towards continuous mo monitoring along with, uh, with the Army. And lastly, if you didn't miss it, he relayed uh, several areas where he needs help from industry. So I'm going to tell you how to, if you weren't there yesterday, I'm going to tell you how to get that information. We had an NCO panel, and that was phenomenal. They had an in-depth discussion on how the backbone of the Army is going to meet the leadership, the training, and the retention challenges of a continuously modernized data-centric Army. And it was a phenomenal conversation. And our new Army CIO, Mr. Garcia, talked to his focus areas, providing updates to policy and guidance, and he's going to be pretty aggressive about that. How they're going to implement, implementate the zero trust while keeping user experience in mind, operationalizing the data strategy, and accelerating the move to the IL-6 cloud. And to close it out, our AFSIA IDEA panel laid out a very programmatic approach to zero trust from a diverse group of leaders and experts. Now, if you didn't get all of this, you can get this, our signal, AFSIA's official media uh, site uh, and uh, um, capabilities providing daily news coverage of TechNet Augusta. And there's going to be recordings and presentations from this week's sessions that are releasable, uh, and we're, they'll be available post-event on our AFSIA website. So if you didn't get any of that information, jump in, because there's a lot for all of us to do in there. All right, it's now my pleasure to introduce our morning keynote speaker, Lieutenant General Maria Barrett, Commanding General of Army Cyber Command. Now, she's, not, uh, she's a very familiar presence here at FC events, and she's a highly engaged leader with a deep breadth of cyber experience. And she comes from a family that understands service, and that is a calling that she has carried throughout her distinguished military career. So without further ado, and without reading her entire bio, where is she? Okay. I am going to please join me in a warm welcome to uh, Lieutenant General Maria Barrett as we welcome her to the stage. Well, good morning, everyone. 
I want to thank General Friedenberg for reserving for me the closing day morning slot. But I can see that uh, you are not too bad off after last night. So that's good. No, seriously, General Lawrence, um, the rest of SIA and everybody else here, thank you for having me here today. And it's, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here and talk about what we're doing. I was pretty excited about the topic. And I was excited about this topic um, because as we are moving towards an Army of 2030 and the Secretary's vision of being moving towards more data-centric operations, and I see the conversations that are happening regarding um, sensor to shooter and a, and a whole bunch of activities that are happening in our Army, you might want to say, what are we doing about the cybersecurity side of the house? And because we, many of the speakers previously talked about driving down complexity and, and getting more, getting some simplicity to what it is that we do. And I'm, I'm really going to hone in on that today. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today is about what does it mean to apply data-centric principles to the defense operations and defense of the Doden. And so if I were going to kind of review where Army Cyber has been, when it stood up nearly 13 years ago, it started off with operate, defend, and attack. And then eventually we added on influence and inform to our mission set. And we've expanded, um, expanded the mission set. Uh, but, but really at the, move this down a little bit, really at the, at the basis of everything is that piece of defend. You know, warfare is still, and we need only to take a look at the Ukraine a very violent endeavor. Cyber alone will not win a war. Failure to defend the networks that our warfighters use absolutely will cause us to lose. So as we're doing all of this work in terms of modernizing the Army, moving to data-centric operations, laying in unified network capabilities, digital transformation, executing the Army data strategy. You know, what does this mean from a cybersecurity standpoint? It does mean that Army Cyber and Netcom and the Cyber Protection Brigade, we have to evolve with this as we're laying in these capabilities. The cyber terrain is changing beneath our feet. And if we don't evolve our cybersecurity, we absolutely put the commander's decision advantage at risk. So where I'd like to start my discussion today is on cybersecurity and just a few observations. In almost every discussion of the data fabric and CJADC2, cloud and data has been central to the conversation. And by implication, the code that supports it. A year ago on this very platform and in subsequent public forums and interviews, I made this statement. And I, I admit, I buried it in my discussions, and I buried it on purpose. I said, we need to think about the ubiquitous use of open source code libraries, especially after malicious cyber actors rapidly operationalized log4j vulnerability. There were a lot of four-syllable words in there. And I did not get one follow-up question. And either I didn't get it because this was painfully obvious or not. So I want to be crystal clear today. We need to protect how we do software development. You heard a little bit of that from Mr. Bang and Mr. Garcega yesterday. 
both from the policy side of the house that they were doing and what they were going to be implementing um, in the acquisition side of the house. And it just warmed my heart. And I swear we did not coordinate our comments. But this is the great thing that is happening right now is we are all for our respective roles in the Army coming to the realization of why these things matter. And, and not only that, have the momentum to make the change. We've always said cybersecurity must be integrated at every step of the IT development. What I have up on the slide is the seven things that we ask people who, who come and deliver capabilities for our cyber, these questions. Some of them are pretty basic. Do you connect your development in environment to the internet? It's kind of important if this is a mission critical system. So I'd ask that you take a look at these. I'm not gonna walk through each one of them. But I'd offer this up if you're a mission owner or a PM, and I can't imagine there's a PM in here that doesn't deal with some sort of development when you're, when you're doing acquisition, right? Think about these questions and put these in your kit bag. And I bet that this is reflected in some of the policies um, and guidance that Mr. Bang and Mr. Garcia are looking at. Some war fighters will probably cringe at the mere suggestion of more cybersecurity for fear that it will asphyxiate innovation and incubation of new ideas. But I, I honestly believe if we don't get after this one, this will be their Achilles heel. And it's not just about the development environments. It, it's also about knowing where your code came from. We, we know that modern software development really relies on, on third-party libraries, and, and that's okay. But we need to make sure that the logging, the access, the transparency can afford us, getting back to the data piece, the proper visibility of that data as it's operating, especially as we move to virtualized and containerized environments. I think it was Mr. Bang talked about a software bill of materials. Whoa. I don't know if I gave a slow clap on that one, but um, this really helps me understand you know, what our risk is. And opaque containers, monoliths, black box software deliveries present significant challenges to me in seeing these events. I think Mr. Garcia yesterday said, hey, bringing your legacy stuff to the cloud isn't a really cool idea. That, I think that was the one I actually clapped on. Software as a service or platform as a service, I, I will tell you that as I scan the environment, I take a look at everything that's going out out there, you know, public disclosures and, and so on and so forth. Most of the securities we see are about misconfigured or the abuse of features that were designed for collaboration, sharing, uh, or integration. Multi-factor authentication will not be enough and, and misconfigurations abound. We need to look closely at granular authorizations once users are authenticated. And, and so this is a key component of what we're looking at in Zero Trust with Mike Smith's team. How do we do that? Foundational to that is, is ICAM and some of the other capabilities which I'll talk about um, in, a, in a minute. And then I think lastly, closing out the cybersecurity piece, I would say is, you know, if you do nothing else, prioritize, prioritize closing virtualization vulnerabilities. I, I'm a great fan of continuous monitoring. I'm even a great fan of putting red teams on our terrain all the time to be out there poking and finding these things. It is that important to providing a defensible unified network. So, now that you've freed me from the burden of supply chain attacks, 
I can start thinking about defending the Army's networks, leveraging these zero trust capabilities. There was some discussion yesterday about how foundational ICAM and, and a modernized ICAM is to proceeding with zero trust. So I'm going to talk to you about some other things and the great work that NETCOM is doing in support of unified network operations and, and, and getting to a zero trust architecture. And, and I'm going to refer to these as the big four. Three of these are in progress right now. Um, actually, all of them are in progress. Uh, we'll probably see three of them close out uh, within the year, uh, and the other one will close out in, an, in a year after that. Uh, but, but the three there are, you know, Army Enterprise, um, Army Endpoint Security Solution, the managed service uh, for endpoint security, 2.0 awarded, team at Netcom is doing some really great work now in when we go to, when we take everybody to E5 licenses, how are we going to integrate that into the solution because we want something that is integrated. I don't know about you, but having three or four cars in the garage uh, to do endpoint security is not my idea of fun. I can only drive one at a time. So if it's integrated in a solution helping our operators with the complexity much better. And so um, re really, really great work uh, in doing that. Not only is it great work, but the fact that, I think Gerald Morrison alluded to it in his comments that we've been pulling the Army or pushing the Army, depending on where you're standing, uh, to get to adopt the enterprise solution. We've got one big organization left and they have signed up to do this and we'll be doing that next month and that's fantastic. That gives me great visibility. Uh, comply to connect. We saw everybody run to remote work during COVID. Um, this idea that we have devices out there, what, how are they plugging in? What are they plugging in? Are they secure? How can we remediate those in an automated fashion? That just gets me so excited. Right, this, I know, I know. For everybody in industry you said, this all been out there for a long time. All right, we're doing it, the pilot started. This is fantastic. I am so excited for everybody who works on the edge trying to define, uh, defend our networks because this is a game changer. Army Unified Directory Service. Think about modernizing our Active Directory structure. I'm not gonna say it's a restructure, it's completely different. Um, but this is really important, not only from a usability standpoint of being able to move from one environment to the other. Again, it's that aspect of simplifying things, um, but also giving us great visibility while we're doing it. This will really help our cyber defenders at Echelon uh, defend better. And then lastly, I'd mentioned unified uh, security information and event management. Um, you seem, for short, uh, combined with Gabriel Nimbus, and I say that intentionally, is gonna think about USEAM as the forward edge, um, like an, a regional cyber center, giving us real-time combat information off the sensors so that they can understand what it is that's happening, but in an integrated way so that we can see this actually across the globe. But it's also enabling us, as we start to lay in some of these capabilities at the tactical level, as we have done already with Elastic Endgame, POC3T's done that, right? Now you can feed that into a regional cyber center and give them that visibility, which is something that they've never had before. You combine that now, if that was the close fight, you combine that now with the deep fight of Gabriel Nimbus and the data that we're able to store in Gabriel Nimbus, and, and these two things really are a game changer for us in terms of seeing ourselves. Having a tool like Gabriel Nimbus has allowed us to move past um, really underperforming tools that couldn't process data fast enough, and it, and it couldn't hold data fast enough. We've really significantly changed the number of events per second that we can process 200-fold. We've um, increased 
We've taken the feeds from something like AESS and a number of other sensors. So that type of log data coming into Gabriel Nimbus is now given, able to give us rapidly assess um, threats on our network. We've doubled the data feeds that are going into Gabriel Nimbus and the number of parses helping to normalize our data feeds. We've doubled the amount of data that we are storing. Uh, and now, in previously we were probably very limited in terms of what kind of feeds we could put into Gabriel Nimbus. That's been broken open. We can probably pull anything in now. And that really is the big idea behind, you know, getting out of the silos of data and fixing that. So, pretty excited where we are in the data picture. But I think we can do more. Cue more. Uh, we rehearse this. Um, you know, previously when we took a look at software we were using for cybersecurity, this was more of an efficiency conversation. You know, duplication of software, um, we, hey, we can get this down to five pieces of software and, and, and interesting conversations like that. Um, we've changed the conversation to data. And what you're looking at is a picture of some initial work that has been done so that we understand the data flows and support of Doden operations and defensive cyberspace operations. Who is using the data? Where does it reside at? These are the types of questions, there are about five big questions that we're asking. It's, and it's pretty important. As we go through and we layer in the capabilities for zero trust in the unified network, and we do convergence, this is really gonna be our anchor of how we see ourselves, and it'll go through several modifications probably as we bring things in. But this idea that, you know, I, I will just tell you that when the Cyber Protection Brigade goes out on a mission, the worst thing that can happen to them is that they land in a data desert. If they land into something that is robust, and I know you purposely can't see this, but trust me, if they land somewhere down in one of the boxes below where there is robust logging and a robust sensor architecture, and whether that data resides regionally or in Gabriel Nimbus, it's incredibly powerful them, and they can work very quickly. There is a direct correlation. If I look historically back at events that the Cyber Protection Brigade has responded to, there is a direct correlation between landing in an organizational network, a non-enterprise network that does not have that robust logging or does not have a robust, or at all, CSSP. You can't defend what you can't see, and this is hugely uh, enabling to us. Um, what I really think, for those of you in industry today, what I really think this is gonna give us is um, now, once you understand what it is that you have, once you now layer that in with perhaps adversary TTPs, answering questions, you now will be able to say, I have the data, I don't have the data to answer that question. And that then drives your data acquisition plan. I'll be able to better articulate to Mr. Garcia and General Morrison all right, we have a gap. This is what I can't see, or this is where I need to have the data in order to, to make it useful to us. And at the end of the day, this is people making decisions. 
this will be absolutely powerful to us in terms of getting to continuous monitoring. If I can shift the balance of cybersecurity readiness inspections to continuous monitoring, uh, that's a good day. Slow clap, Mr. Garcega. Yeah, probably a whole bunch of other people in the room. Um, so this idea of organi organizational convergence, centralized delivery of services is not just about the efficiency. It is going to make us more secure because of the visibility we're gonna be able to have. Again, a, the distinguishing feature for the CPB is if they can land in an organization that has robust sensors, robust logging available to them in a knowledgeable workforce, they can work very quickly. The convergence includes ECMA. And so if cloud is gonna be a key part of how the Army fights in 2030, then integrating ECMA into uh, Army cyber operations is absolutely imperative. And then as General Friedenberg kind of highlighted back to General Skinner's comments, CSSP readiness. This is the overwatch and the first response to any anomalous activity that we have on the network. And so raising their game commensurate with the threat is, is hugely important to me. Um, understanding the readiness. As we take a look at the readiness reporting and what General Skinner and Cybercom are requiring us to do, they're doing it currently at ESM 10 standards. They'll move to ESM 11. We very much understand what our organic uh, regional cyber centers are capable of providing in both of those constructs. And so I feel pretty good about those. Uh, we know we have Army mission owners who have leveraged one of the three fee-for-service um, CSSPs. A good amount of CSSP workload is done by those three entities. General Skinner and I have talked about this as well. It's an issue across the Department of Defense. Uh, the SLAs those mission owners have engaged in with those fee-for-service CSSPs may or may not meet the standards for readiness that are being put out. That's where I think we'll have the most significant work to do. And it's, it's not the fee-for-service, it's not necessarily the fee-for-service um, CSSP's fault. That's what their customer asked for. So, now the fun part. I'm waiting for Dr. Stanton's uh, PhD level questions. <laughs> Please don't use four syllable words with me. But uh, hey, thanks everybody. Um, I also wanna thank, really incredible to watch um, both kind of ends of the spectrum, this session, this event. Uh, one, the fact the engagements with the industry were fantastic this week. Uh, everybody who was out on the floor in the individual meetings, there's some really groundbreaking work being done out there. And, and it, was, it was absolutely, this is one of the best events that I truly enjoy uh, getting to deep dive into a number of topics um, and really focus on those things. So I wanna thank industry uh, for being here and I hope this was beneficial to everybody. And then on the other end of the, I was just tickled pink watching um, the winners from the, um, the, the competition yesterday. The kids were just fantastic. Um, and, and really this is where it starts. I think the DOD CIO is tracking something like 30,000. I might be a little bit off on my numbers, but about 30,000 shortfall in cyber, cyber security professionals in the department. The number I'm really concerned about is what he follows generally with is a number which is something like 700,000 shortfall in the United States. 
And so we can be really focused on better recruiting and retention in DOD. But honestly, as I take a look at our industry partners who recruit for the same talent workforce, right, you need it. You need it too. You need these kids. And you need to, we need to be, all be part of that pipeline and building it um, earlier. And so um, kudos to everybody who was supporting that event. Um, I can't say enough about it. And that was not on my speech. So that's from here. All right, I'm ready. Ma'am, we'll start with a recruitment question since you've Fantastic. teed it up for us. With recruitment across the Army Challenge, how does Army Cyber plan to acquire and sustain the talent required to meet the cyber workforce requirements necessary to win? Recruiting for us is not a problem. We're, there are plenty, I, we've got parents who call us up and say my child wants to be, uh, go into the cyber branch, how can, they, how can they get there? So that's not the issue, there is the retention piece. I, I do think one of the things that we attract is the mission and the fact that it's legal to do what we do. Uh, it's not legal to do it out there. Um, but that can only go so far. I, we're, we have a number of, uh, I, I call them levers, right? Service obligations for the exquisite training that we're giving you, um, uh, special pay, um, incentive pays, and we're doing some of these things also on the civilian side of the house because we want to retain them as well. Uh, I think that from my perspective, while we lay all, of, we are maximizing everything that Congress has given us. Um, so from my perspective, uh, I got to keep doing that. I need to keep watching whether these things are producing the readiness that we need and then communicating that clearly back to the Army senior leadership. They've been hugely supportive of all of these initiatives uh, that we've had. But I, I project it's still going to remain a challenge. It is the number one thing that I spend time on is readiness. What do you think it will take for commanders to feel more comfortable using cyber to, to facilitate offensive or defensive action as part of major operations? It, uh, what I think is some of the things that we're doing, incorporated into leader, leader uh, education. Matter of fact, this afternoon, I'm gonna be talking to one of the Army uh, commander courses that's held out in Leavenworth. So getting them familiar with what is in the realm of the possible um, on the spectrum of um, operations. Uh, incorporating it into um, uh, training environments. National Training Center is incorporating both information, a lot of information advantage uh, and offensive uh, and electronic warfare. There are some initiatives by the G357 about home station training for um, electronic warfare and operating in contested uh, environments. So there's actually a lot of work being done right now at all echelons to get people comfortable with some of these topics and, and actually start training to them. Good question. Can you uh, elaborate on who takes care of what part of information assurance and cybersecurity at the edge between tactical units and our cyber? Hmm. I, I think what you're, you, you threw in information advantage, which is a pretty broad um, portfolio of activities, um, from influencing activities to offensive, understanding electronic uh, magnetic spectrum and the elect and what electronic warfare activities might be taking place. So that is, we could be here for another hour breaking that apart. And maybe that's a good theme for next year. Uh, but I think this, what tasks are being done from a cybersecurity standpoint, that will be shifting as we look to drive 
complexity out of the lower echelons. I, I think it. I think that's where we're going to see that raise up. Whether that will exist at the BCT level, continue to exist at the BCT level, will it go up to division, or will some tasks actually be up at core, um, or even beyond? I know I have Netcom uh, starting to take a look at. Hey, if you were actually going to uh, manage. Um, common services for a division, what would that look like and, and would it work in a, in a, um, in a DDL environment? What, what would that start to look like? And so we're starting to think through those things. Because that's really going to tell us what is, in the, what is in the realm of the possible. So not a really awesome answer for you, uh, because I think there are still some decisions we need to make uh, before we can come back and settle down on it's exactly going to be that person in the division who's going to do that task. As the RCCs and CSSPs become enabled and empowered with more analytic and AI-based capabilities to better defend and respond to activity in their sectors of the DOTA, what do you foresee the CPTs doing in the future? Oh, I don't think they're going to be out of a job. Yeah, I, the CPTs, as originally designed, were launching forward with Kit you know, and going and, you know, censoring up something and, and, uh, and then doing their, either their uh, uh, mission threat defense mission or a uh, hunting mission. Um, as we get more connected and we understand where our data flows are and we flatten the network, guess what? CPTs don't really have to, sometimes they don't actually have to go anywhere. It is hugely important though for to put some people on the ground to understand what the problem is that the, the vendors forward are seeing. Um, and so we do still send them out. But the bulk of the work in an ideal state is done back here, where we have an analytic support cell that is taking a look at the logging data and everything and, 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 and really crushing it. And so that's what I think is the ideal state. Um, what I also see is as we start to, um, as we, we really want to be focused on more sophisticated threats, what is the latest and breaking thing that we are looking for? And if we can take the work that they do today and normalize it and kind of hand that, those analytics off to the regional cyber centers to run or embed that in whatever AI ML tool that we have um, and then just keep that cycle going, right? So, so work on exquisite things over here and then normalize it and bring it back down to the regional cyber centers for that regional approach. I think that's, that would be my ideal state. How will our cyber's trans-regional theater information advantage detachment be resourced from a force structure perspective, and how will it differ from and interact with the regionally focused TIADs? Um, so we're actually going to have a, um, there are a couple of GOSs that are going to be meeting this fall. I actually can't talk to the resourcing um, question right now because it gets ahead of uh, some decisions that the Army staff has to make um, on force structure. So I'm going to have to get back to you on that one. At the 2022 question? session, you mentioned the creation and efforts towards the CONUS RCC becoming the GRCC. Yep. Would you share your progress? It happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, it's been stood up, um, and, and, and this was primarily driven by the fact that, you know, you now ha are running Army 365. You are running a global service. And so it really necessitated us, and I see more of that coming. Who is, and, and even as we take a look at um, the movement to um, uh, SIPR and IL-6, 
who from the Army is going to represent Army equities up to DISA. And we, you know, there's still a little bit of work to do on roles and responsibilities in a, in a global tenant. Um, but the face of that is going to be, you know, that global network operations center. It's absolutely going to be imperative to, you know, kind of doing one-stop shopping for how you're going to, you know, solve the hard problems of what's going on in the network or the cloud or, you know, the, the BCAP or whatever it is that we're talking about. So my assessment is it's up and running and it's good and it's going to continue to grow and evolve. Ma'am, can you talk a, a little bit about how the ECMA and our cyber relationship will work? Yeah, so um, the XORD, um, Army published an XORD driving on orgnet convergence. Uh, there were a couple of orgnets that were a little bit unique, and we had to kind of come back and do some more thinking about how this would actually work. Um, what I, what I realized was that as you took a look at uh, what we had kind of negotiated with ECMA in terms of, hey, this is how your your this is how much orgnet convergence we're going to do with you. It really fell short of what we need to do in terms of being truly operational. Um, ECMA is is providing really critical um, services. Uh, to the Army. And so in terms of how we see the threat every single day and communicating that effectively and swiftly to them so that they can make modifications uh, was, was hugely important. The other piece is, is that we're going to live in this um, on-prem, off, you know, cloud environment for some period of time. And so synchronizing those operations, day-to-day -day operations of just prof providing services or laying in all these capabilities that are going to be pivotal to zero trust, this has to be integrated at some level, integrated and synchronized. And, and the piece of the data that I need to see in order to make sense of it. And so it really meant that we needed to tighten this relationship up and normalize it as we have with other ordnance. And so they were open to that. So what we've agreed to do is we will start, we will start, it, they will be OpCon for any sort of defensive cyberspace operations that, I, that come about. We will be able to be directive in nature. But the real work is going to happen probably in the next month, um, which is how do we make this a more enduring framework across all the, the pillars of support that ECMA is doing for the Army? And uh, I owe that answer back to Mr. Garcia and Gerald Morrison. And, and, and so I think the question will be later at a follow-on AFSIA event is, what does the enduring relationship look like? But for now, um, you know, I, what I see is potentially um, ECMA uh, is kind of like a subordinate command with a very, almost like the Cyber Protection Brigade is a subordinate command with a very specific defensive mission, but yet it integrates with NETCOM units all the time. And so we understand, depending on the mission, when NETCOM is the supported commander and when they are the supporting commander for an operation. And so I think we'll see those same things work out with ECMA. If you're doing a day-to-day -day mission, um, you know, when a defensive uh, activity comes about and I, you know, hey, I need you to report back on whether or not these vulnerabilities exist or this configuration, blah, 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 right? In that case, I'm I'm now supported at Army Cyber. But if we're talking about implementing a particular capability, either ECMO or NETCOM, you know, interchangeably, depending on what we're talking about, could be the supported or supporting commander. So I think this is kind of like normal operations. That was our last question, ma'am. Fantastic. <laughs> it's been a pleasure talking to you all today.
Please welcome Paul Frederick back to the stage. All right, we need we need to pop up the uh, walk up music for the last day. Uh, thank you, uh, General. Where did you, there you are. Thank you, General Barrett, uh, for these uh, comments. Uh, I'll tell you. Uh, I know, as as the operational arm of the of the Army, to bring all this together, that you have to be ecstatic with what we've heard and the alignment that we've heard across the force uh, to 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 deliver these capabilities, uh, integrated with the training, uh, the resources, uh, and um, and and your team is is just managing. You know what I mean? The the implementation of all that. It is just phenomenal to see this, and I'm sure you're as excited about it as, as we all are, but thank you for this, uh, this picture you provided us here today. And uh, in lieu of a, a, a gift, a donation is going to be made to the Fort Gordon uh, Historical Museum Society on your behalf. And we know that's all critical and important to all of us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you can refer to your, the screens here, uh, to your show guide, uh, or to your app. Uh, and you can see all the various breakout sessions we're going to have for the remainder of the day here. Uh, note that we are going to close out the PEO program with two sessions that start at 9 o'clock over at the Georgia Cyber Center. And we have one mandatory keynote for this entire event, right? How many, how many folks remember that, right, when back at the uh, schoolhouse? The reason why we're all here uh, is because we are trying to uh, rapidly integrate capabilities into our army. And that is what General Rainey is going to talk about at 1230 right in here. And so that is the mandatory place to be at 1230. We'll see you all back in here at 10 o'clock for a panel on synchronizing the critical roles to enable data-centric army. And as a reminder, all of these sessions in Oglethorpe are being uh, recorded and will be available on demand at, at the FCA YouTube channel after the event. We're now going to move into a break in the exhibit hall, so please take this chance to visit with our industry partners down there. Thank you very much. <laughs>